Two years after leaving, he'd produce Queen Mab, expanding his attacks on the state, which he now berates for being run by criminals, by royal murderers whose mean thrones are bought by crimes of treachery and gore. Then Shelley's analysis continues. The bread they eat, the staff on which they lean, depended on their crime. And as for the royal family's displays of power, the British Empire's army and navy, these are hired bravos who defend the tyrant's throne, the bullies of his fear. These are the sinks and channels of worst vice, the refuse of society, the dregs of all that is most vile. And he condemns them for thinking their uniforms give them immunity. Guards, garbed in blood-red livery, surround their palaces, participate the crimes that force defends, and from a nation's rage secures the crown, which all the curses reach that famine, frenzy, woe, and penury breathe. Not a passage designed to find favour on Remembrance Day, were the myth that to die for kings and queens still magically makes any war a good war, a myth perpetuated by the unthinking. Shelley insists that all wars are war crime. Man has no right to kill his brother. It is no excuse that he does so in uniform. He only adds the infamy of servitude to the crime of murder. While at Oxford, Shelley would write a third pamphlet, never discovered by the powers that be. It was called The Existing State of Things, and this one he publishes the most discreetly. For it poses the clearest threat to the British power base, and so, for Monday's safety during its printing, he is referred to as Lundi, the French for Monday, and his poem again is circulated anonymously. In The Existing State of Things, also written aged nineteen, Shelley exposes the glorification of war, and he shows the powerful cynically promoting it to fuel a profitable death culture. Millions to fight compelled to fight or die in mangled heaps on war's red altar lie, when legal murders swell the lists of pride, when glories view the titled idiot guide. It is the cold advisers of yet colder kings who have the power to breathe o'er all the world the infectious blast of death. In it, Shelley also urges George the Third to shift his ample behind and to let everyone else sit on his throne. Man must assert his native rights, must say, we take from monarch's hand the granted sway. And in these lines, the nineteen-year-old expresses his ideal, a blueprint for an alternative society. Oppressive law no more shall power retain. Peace, love, and concord once shall rule again. He rejects violence as circular and unnatural, and he embraces a pacifist socialism of evolutionary change, in which a humanity fed on goodness may become virtuous through cause and effect. He spurns college meals, attends only one lecture, and he lives off bread pudding, raisins and almonds, stewed fruit, cakes and gingerbread, but no red meat, insisting that he isn't a corpse cruncher. Shelley's watchword is that he wishes no living creature harm, and his fellow student, Thomas Jefferson Hogg, says the seeds of Shelley's vegetarian theories are sown in Oxford, where he declares the use of dead flesh makes men barbarous. Hogg said that Shelley lived like an untidy hermit, and describes his friends' college rooms. Books, boots, papers, shoes, philosophical instruments, clothes, pistols, linen, crockery, 
ammunition, and files innumerable, with money, stockings, prints, crucibles, bags, and boxes were scattered on the floor and in every place. An electrical machine, an air pump, the galvanic trough, a solar microscope. For fun, Shelley and Hogg would sail paper boats on the lake at Headington Hill, where Shelley dreams of and discusses a flying machine as they both try to outrun the wind. The balloon has not yet received the perfection of which it is surely capable, Shelley would say. The art of navigating the air is in its first and most helpless infancy, and he'd speak of aeronauts flying across continents. If you could manufacture water, Shelley would exclaim, as ideas tumbled over ideas, you could transform the deserts of Africa into rich meadows and vast fields of maize. His pistols were a precaution against the Shelley baiting, of which he had been a victim at school. He never used them, but he'd find, if he brandished them wild-eyed, then all college bullies could be turned into cowards. The tables, Hogg completed his inventory, and especially the carpet, were stained with large spots of various hues, which proclaimed the agency of fire. Shelley's scientific and chemical experiments came close to setting the college ablaze, but such flames could be put out, unlike those in his brain, still smouldering centuries later. In 2010, the veteran firebrand Tariq Ali declared, given Parliament's inability to meet real needs, why not a convocation of regional assemblies with a social charter that can be fought for and defended, just as Shelley advised? Ali then quoted from Shelley's Mask of Anarchy, Ye who suffer woes untold, or to feel, or to behold, your lost country, bought and sold, with a price of blood and gold. In the same year, the investigative journalist John Pilger urged the country to take to the streets. There is no other way now. Direct action. Civil disobedience. Unerring. Read Shelley and do it.